My name is Julie Tai, and I'm president of the New York League of Conservation Voters and the New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund. I'd like to remind everybody that this evening is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. I want to thank all of the candidates and staff for joining us today. These discussions are designed to educate and inform campaigns for city council, borough president, controller, and mayor on key environmental and public health issues facing our city. We hope to teach you about important environmental issues so that you're informed as you continue to run for office and while you're in office. For first time candidates, we think of this as just the beginning of a fruitful relationship with you and hope we can continue to partner on these priority issues. Tonight, we have two panel discussions, one about lead poisoning and one about parks and open space. Toxic chemicals in our environment is one of the most pressing public health issues. That's why lead poisoning prevention is one of our top priorities. Exposure to lead can cause irreparable neurological and behavioral health consequences, especially for children who have developing bodies. We've been working on reducing lead poisoning for years, from paint, dust, and drinking water, as part of our efforts to reduce toxins in our environment. In 2018, we helped publish a report on the negative health impacts of lead poisoning in New York City and reviewed the city's enforcements of its lead poisoning prevention law. In 2019, we published a, helped publish a follow-up report on the inadequate enforcement of lead dust standards. Earlier this year, we released a report which showed that it's time to reevaluate our standards for lead in school drinking water. Clearly, we have more work to do, and this is one of our priorities for 2021. If you have questions for our panelists, you can use the QA function, and we will address the questions at the end of each panel. To hear more, let's get to our first round of panelists. Our first panelist is Dr. Maury Markowitz. Dr. Dermarkowitz received his MD from the Albert Einstein School of Medicine of Yeshiva University in 1974. He then completed his pediatrics training at Montefiore Medical Center, including a year as chief resident. Since the end of his training, he has been in, an attending at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, where he sees patients with calcium or phosphate disorders and those with lead or mercury poisoning. He's also been an active research investigator focused on discovering improved methods to diagnose and treat children with these problems. Dr. Markowitz, over to you. Thanks, Julie. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, that 1974 is the tip off that I've been doing this for a really, really long time, uh, more than four decades. Uh, and my, my role as the first speaker is, is to uh, put the issue of lead poisoning in perspective, why it's still an important problem in New York City and why you need to know about it. But I'd like to start by giving some history on it and pose the following question. When do you think the first medical description of lead poisoning was reported? How long ago was that first case? Think for a second, pick any number in your head. How many years back? If you're ready, if you thought 100 years ago, you'd be right. If you thought 200 years ago, you'd be right. If you thought 1,000 years ago, you'd be right. If you thought 2,000 years ago, you're finally getting close. 2,300 years ago, a Greek physician described occupational lead exposure, uh, potentially resulting in the death of the worker who was melting rocks in order to extract the metals, including lead, and inhaling the fumes. And he, he very nicely described, if you don't get this person away from the job, he's going to die. So what did we do with that information? Well, we either created or found dozens and dozens of lead compounds and found hundreds of applications for those compounds, different uses. If we went back further, about five to 10,000 years ago, when mining began, we would see that there was almost no lead on the surface of the planet, which means that all creatures on the surface of the planet did not evolve to be able to deal with this poison. But as it became clear how useful it was, how cheap it was, We've extracted and spread about 300 million tons of lead on the surface of the planet. This is an indestructible element, which means that the potential for lead exposure is here forever, as long as the planet exists for every creature that's on top of the surface. 
But we've learned a lot about how to mitigate the exposure to try and prevent the ingestion of lead because that's the primary way that lead gets into a person, at least a kid. An adult can inhale. It doesn't get through skin with the exception of one of the compounds that was used very frequently in the middle of the 20th century. And that was tetraethyl lead, the gasoline additive. And that was phased out in the US in the late 1970s. And by the early 80s, it was gone. And now it's only used in aviation fuel for propeller planes, which means that living next to a, a small airport may not be the safest thing to do. The major uses of lead that have resulted in the persistence of lead poisoning in New York City kids were three. The first was the use of lead paint, uh, known at the turn of the 20th century to be a, a major source of lead poisoning in children and was eliminated uh, from allowable uses in homes in other countries of the world, but not the United States. We expanded its use. Uh, great advertising, it's a wonderful product. You could uh, wash it, it was shiny, it came in different colors. Lead-based paint, good product, terrible for living things. And again, indestructible. I've read that there were estimates between one and two million housing units in New York City built before 1960 when the most lead paint was being used. All of that could potentially still be there if the apartments hadn't been completely renovated and the paint removed. Of those apartments, maybe 300,000 have little kids in them. And those little kids are the ones who put everything in their mouths because that's normative behavior in the first three years of life in particular. But it also means that anybody who regularly touches surfaces that may have lead dust coming from deteriorated lead paint and puts their hands in their mouths or their toys in their mouth or other objects in their mouth, they can be eating small amounts of lead repeatedly throughout the day in their homes. And that's certainly been a risk that I'm concerned about during the period of COVID when families have been basically locked in their homes for extended periods of time and living potentially in, in homes that have poor housing conditions uh, with lead paint becoming more and more available. The third was cans of food. We used to solder those with lead solder. We don't do that anymore. We stopped somewhere in the 1980s and we use lead solder for other purposes as well, including sealing uh, pipes uh, that carry our water and the pipes themselves could have been made with lead as well. So there are many sources that are residual from our past use in New York City, even though for lead paint, the city capped the amount that was permitted for homes in 1960, New York State did it in 1970, and the federal government in 1978. Schools in New York City, the Department of Education continued to use lead-based paint in the schools into the mid-1980s, as we only recently discovered a couple of years ago. So lots of sources, lots of hand-to-mouth activity, and the absorption of the lead that is digested from paint, from the dust, goes into blood. And the blood acts as the highway. It distributes the lead everywhere to every cell in the body, every organ, every tissue, and especially accumulating in bone where it can stay for years to decades. The organ that seems to be most sensitive to lead is the brain. It's the critical organ. And it seems to take very little lead to have a measurable effect. We use the blood lead test to determine whether a child has been exposed sufficiently and ingested enough to absorb enough lead so that we can detect it in the blood. A single blood lead level gives us a potential correlate of harm. It doesn't tell us for sure because it's a single time point, not a movie of how long the child's been exposed, only that at least at that point in time when we measured the lead in the blood and found it there, we know that that child had lead in the environment and it's getting into that child or had in the past. And then our goal becomes to try and mitigate the result of that exposure by eliminating it, by getting rid of the lead paint in the child's environment, the dust that came from it, any foods that might be contaminated, water, if that's the source. Although New York City, that's a very uncommon source. So our first objective when we test a child 
and screening is mandatory in the state for one and two year olds is, is to see whether there's anything there. And then we have lead levels that guide us for what we do. The current level of intervention is five micrograms per deciliter in blood. That number five does not represent when lead poisoning starts. We don't know if there's any safe lead level as we assess it in blood, maybe somewhere between zero and one microgram per deciliter. Five is an epidemiologic number. It tells us the top two and a half percent of the distribution. So if, if we took a thousand kids, 25 of those kids, the top two and a half percent would have had a lead of five or more if they were tested uh, back around 2010. So that's our target group because we don't have enough money to, to treat everybody. Our goal for secondary intervention is, is really chasing the problem because the child's already lead poisoned. The primary thing we should be doing is primary prevention. And that means housing control so that the laws that we have on the books are actually enforced and families don't have to live in poor conditions that result in the exposure, the potential, potential ingestion and toxicity that accumulates. About toxicity and about the effect on brain, because it's been the driver for research for the last 40 years and we've learned a ton. It doesn't take much lead, that's true. If we were to compare two groups of kids, say two-year-olds, one group had a blood lead of 10 micrograms per deciliter, right? twice the intervention level, and the other group had a level of one, we would see that there's a difference in the average IQ between those two groups of kids. And I'm using IQ generically. A test of cognitive abilities would indicate that there was a lower score in the kids who had a lead of 10. If we translate it into IQ points, it could be somewhere between four and six IQ points lower for the kids who had a lead of 10, all else being the same in their lives. So a little bit of lead can have an impact. Would you know that you lost four to six IQ points? Probably not. And neither would your parent. Unless you were right on the cusp, your teacher wouldn't know either. And by cusp, I mean, if you were needing remedial help and you lose four to six IQ points, that's going to push you down uh, significantly and you'll need a lot of help. That's one part is the cognitive ability. The second is the ability to, to be able to retain the information, memory, to control your attention, to control your behavior. That's also hurt by lead at relatively low levels as we assess it in the blood. So the blood lead is our assessment tool, but it's again chasing after the fact. And what we really need to focus on is preventing the lead poisoning to begin with. It doesn't distribute evenly in our populations. Kids who are poor live in poorer housing. So they're the highest risk groups. So the effort has to be to focus on the high risk groups for the resources that we have in the city, I think. Uh, and to be able to control the exposure by making sure that the laws on the books are effective and that the administration of those laws is fulfilled as required. I'm open to any questions and I, I'm happy to do it both during this um, webinar and afterwards. I can be reached through Montefiore Medical Center uh, by any kind of a web search at Montefiore. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great kickoff to this panel. Uh, appreciate it, Dr. Markowitz. Our next panelist is Taylor Morton. Taylor is the Director of Environmental Health and Education at WEACT for Environmental Justice. They have been working with WEACT since 2016, formerly as an intern, environmental health fellow, educational consultant, and environmental health and education manager. Lots of different hats there at WEACT. Uh, among their responsibilities are leading education programs such as the Environmental Health and Justice Leadership Training and WEACT's Climate Education Policy Initiatives, as well as the organization's NYCHA Healthy Homes Program, which seeks to improve the health and future of public housing residents. Taylor also recognizes the importance of exposing BIPOC and low-income youth to natural elements and actively supports this mission. 
Taylor. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we can stop on this slide. Um, so picking up on, uh, on where our last presenter left off, a uh, really important thing to us at WE Act for Environmental Justice is understanding uh, not only the role that environmental health plays on our quality of life and on our life expectancy, uh, but understanding housing as a health determinant. I know it was, it was previously mentioned that uh, uh, kids who are poor live in, in poor housing and uh, understanding that uh, if housing has such an impact on our health that we can see that happen in a lot of, uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, so a key part of understanding how uh, lead impacts communities of color and lower income communities uh, is understanding uh, how this how this uh, issue connects to, uh, to housing as a whole uh, and really understanding that uh, a lot of folks who live with lead in their homes also live with a lot of other uh, environmental health and environmental justice issues uh, and really understanding that uh, that uh, home renovations is, is really key to this and understanding that who our our landlord is is also key to this and how we're able to keep uh, folks accountable to uh, any legislation that we set around mold and actually make sure that that's being implemented equitably is uh, key. Next slide. Uh, so some of the information that I decided to use with you all today uh, is, is really highlighting this idea that, um, uh, that when we look at housing, we think about housing uh, that uh, it's actually a health determinant and, and looking at lead specifically. Uh, the information that is uh, on display here is from the New York City Environmental Health and Data Portal, uh, which is a really great resource and, and giving us a deeper insight into um, data from the lives of, of New Yorkers. Uh, and in a lot of ways I've used it in my work to highlight some of the inequities when we look at uh, look at health, uh, especially at, at indoor environmental health. Um, but as we've seen here, uh, we, we're able to see uh, a deeper look into neighborhood poverty and, and the, the numbers of, uh, of neighborhoods that are considered to be uh, impoverished, specifically thinking about children under the age of, of five years old. Uh, and the legislation that we've set, we have set around, uh, around lead uh, is specifically looking at children who are under the age of six and understanding their vulnerability. And while trends have, uh, trends have generally gone down, we, we, we've been able to see uh, in the neighborhoods that have high poverty, uh, there are more children under the age of five who have been impacted by, uh, by lead poisoning. Uh, and uh, in this map on the right, uh, I think this is really key. Uh, I use a lot, maps a lot in my work to really highlight this idea that um, our zip code determines a lot of things about our health, right? Uh, on this, this trend of uh, looking at housing as a health determinant. Uh, and if we look at different parts of New York City, we're able to see a really specific story. When we look at communities of color, uh, including Northern Manhattan and large parts of the Bronx, uh, when we look at, at parts of of Brooklyn and Queens as well, and parts of Staten Island, uh, we're re really able to see uh, that communities who have been impacted by uh, uh, by uh, lead and mold, uh, and not having access to healthy foods, not having access to a lot of other resources, um, seem to have a synergy around these uh, around these issues, uh, which really raises the importance and, in a lot of ways, raises the consequence for. Uh, for uh, lead poisoning, right? Now these aren't uh, communities who are only impacted by one issue and, and, and that's it at the end of the day, right? A lot of the children who are impacted by lead are also those who, who are impacted by, um, impacted by other issues and, and uh, a lot of times have parents who aren't able to take them out of school or who have to take off of work. And, and that's a, another consequence for them who aren't able to take them off of work when uh, a parent or a teacher, uh, a teacher or an administrator calls home uh, saying that your, your child is acting out or having behavioral issues or, or other issues in school. So it can be a really, uh, a really tight spot for, uh, a really tight spots for a lot of folks. Uh, and, and really 
uh, begs uh, an issue around what it means to be resilient, what it means to uh, engage your landlord of whether or not you live in public housing or private housing, uh, whether you are, uh, as mentioned before, already dealing with uh, environmental justice issues and, and whether or not you're dealing with uh, a lot of other issues that uh, may or may not have to directly do with environmental health, but might be re uh, related to economic injustices or uh, any of those, those other areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another thing to, to also think about and to consider uh, when we look at different, uh, different local laws and different initiatives uh, that have, have been enacted, um, that the creation of laws is one thing, but implementing the law is, is, is something else. Um, we really wanna make sure that folks are getting, uh, folks are getting what they need. If, if we've seen there's a crisis as well in, um, in public housing, uh, and that's related to a lot of, of infrastructure and maintenance issues that haven't, uh, haven't been resolved. Uh, and, and folks who live in public housing have a, a very specific avenue uh, for which they keep, uh, keep NYCHA accountable uh, that's different than, uh, different than public housing. So uh, that's something to also consider as well. That's that the solutions that we uh, bring for communities of color, lower income communities, um, yield different solutions depending on um, depending on where um, where you live, um, and that's been been really key and important. Uh, and even thinking about the abatement process, right? Uh, a lot of folks in our membership have had questions about what the abatement process is is uh, going to look like uh, for them, and that uh, when your your home is is you're having lead paint removed in your home that you're not supposed to be there, uh, right? For a risk that you could breathe in the, uh, the, the paint chips, right? But a lot of folks uh, don't have a, a place to go. And then a lot of times they aren't offered an, another place to be in that uh, in the removal of the, the lead paint itself presents a lot of risks for folks. Um, and we've heard a lot of stories that I, I wanna just really uplift and from, from our members and uh, from folks who, who have been a member and who have passed by and, and more recently from uh, one of our members who's involved in our public housing um, working group uh, around her, her own struggles with mold and uh, with, uh, excuse me, with lead in her child. Uh, and that uh, he started to have the behavioral issues and, and she had a really difficult time uh, uh, of getting her apartment tested, of going through the process. And that has been uh, a struggle for her. And, um, and we want to really make sure that as we are going through and addressing these, that uh, folks who are going to be impacted first and worst as we, we think about uh, folks who are identify as, as of color or live in lower income communities uh, who are going to live in um, uh, housing that has poor quality, who are going to be impacted by lead, uh, that they uh, will, will receive the help that um, the health that they need when we think about this issue. You can exit the slideshow. Um, the last thing I want to leave you all with, and it's something that I've, I've mentioned before here, uh, is just to really think, uh, think deeply about uh, a lot of the issues that uh, communities of color, low-income communities are, are dealing with at this time, uh, that oftentimes it is not, uh, not only lead poisoning, um, but lead poisoning on top of, of all of these other issues can make it really difficult for, for folks to be uh, resilient. And that's something that, uh, that we should all consider when we're thinking about solutions to these, um, solutions to, to issues like these. Um, and that we should all consider when we're thinking about uh, policy and legislation and, and finding different ways to address uh, issues like lead. Thank you. That is a, an excellent reminder for everyone that it's it's complicated and it's multifactorial and that makes things much more difficult for folks. So thank you for that, Taylor. Um, our next two panelists are Brendan Kilbasa and Liam Riley, who will be presenting together. Uh, Brandon is a tenant organizer who's worked for Cooper Square Committee in New York City's Lower East Side for the last 14 years and now serves as director of organizing and policy. He sees himself as a social change practitioner and practices community organizing because he believes it is essential for individuals and communities to be engaged in solving their own problems and for them to gain strength and knowledge by doing so. 
Liam Riley is a tenant organizer with the Cooper Square Committee, a tenants right nonprofit working to preserve and develop affordable, environmentally healthy housing, community and cultural spaces in New York City's Lower East Side. His work is driven by the understanding that housing is a human right. Liam is active in grassroots efforts against displacement, mass incarceration and deportation in New York City and on the Jersey Shore. Brandon and Liam, over to you. Great, thank you, Julie. So again, I'm Brandon Kilbasa and I'm the Director of Organizing at the Cooper Square Committee and joined by my coworker, Liam, who I'll let introduce himself in a minute. Um, Cooper Square Committee is a longstanding tenants rights organization that's been around for over 60 years now on the Lower East Side. Um, our specialty is tenant organizing. Um, and we generally group our work into two kinds of um, kind of buckets in the organizing that we do. Um, we do anti-displacement organizing, which is helping tenants organize against their landlords and push back to keep their homes um, using direct action and any number of techniques. And then we do issue-based campaigns. Um, the issue-based campaigns take on the larger issues that tenants might face like construction as harassment or um, housing court, or in this case, uh, housing um, and lead poisoning. So, you know, we've been working with uh, to help organize tenants around lead issues in housing now for about five or six years in the Lower East Side. Um, and Liam's gonna uh, give some examples of where the work came from specifically in a minute. Um, I wanna set, kind of start by saying though that the, the scope of, of lead safety and housing is kind of broad, um, you know, lead uh, contamination can come through water, it can come through chipped and peeling paint, and it can come through um, uncontrolled construction dust when landlords do work in older buildings that have lead paint on the walls and they don't use the proper precautions. And um, the work that we've been drawn into through our members um, has been largely in this last category of things. They've been the most interested in taking on, um, you know, construction dust and contamination vis-a-vis -vis unchecked construction and lack of safe work practices. So most of the presentation that Liam and I are gonna to do today are gonna to concentrate kind of in that area. Um, but on that note, I'm gonna let Liam introduce himself before we get into the rest of our presentation. Sure, thanks, Brandon. Um, my name is Liam Riley. I'm a tenant organizer with Cooper Square and I help coordinate uh, Lead Dust Free NYC, which is a a coalition sort of under Cooper's umbrella um, of tenants from across the city who have been exposed to lead dust and who are focused um, on organizing to end lead poisoning uh, here in New York. Uh, we're calling for stronger enforcement of New York City's lead laws as well as new legislation to protect tenants from toxic lead dust exposure. Um, I think now Brandon will probably speak to the ineffectiveness of uh, some of the laws that are currently on the books due to lack of enforcement uh, before I go into a little bit more detail about uh, you know, our organizing work. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to I'm going to touch on just uh, for a moment some of the laws that are in place and some of the things that have uh, made them ineffective. Um, and then we'll let Liam get into some case examples and then we're going to close out by making kind of some more direct recommendations for electeds, um, be legislative or otherwise. So um, for folks who don't know, and I think it's been spoken to a little bit already in the presentation, Local Law 1 of 2004 is New York City's main lead prevention law. Um, is designed to prevent kids from getting lead poisoned. And it's broad. It's a, actually a very comprehensive, well-written law that speaks to uh, what happens when there is chipped and peeling paint, uh, what happens when work is being done in an older building, a building before 1960. Um, and to be quite honest, if all of the law was being followed, we probably wouldn't have any many of the same lead problems we have right now today. Um, City Council has recently passed several uh, additional laws to strengthen um, the network of laws that are in place and they're, uh, they're good additions, but Local Law 1 is a very strong law. And the thing that's really um, happening that's making it ineffective at this point, it the things that are happening that are making it ineffective are really uh, lack of vigorous enforcement and regulations. So, um, at this point, on the agency level within New York City's agencies, uh, things could be done a lot differently to carry out the enforcement uh, provisions of Local Law 1. Um, just uh, two or three um, aspects of the law are coming to mind that if the city was 
citing landlords for violations um, for these things, I think that our lead problems would be far less. Um, the law says that landlords are supposed to abate friction surfaces at vacancy at this point. Um, it's been, you know, this has been the law for over 15 years now. Landlords by far do not abate the windows and door frames on vacancy in units unless they are called out on it in some way. They just don't do it generally. These friction surfaces are what causes the microscopic dust that poisons children. Um, and then when the city's not finding landlords or asking them for the proof that they did this, they're just not going to do it. It's an added expense to them. And uh, it's, it's without con any kind of enforcement of it, it's not happening. It could make a big, big difference if that was happening. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, doing uh, annual inspections, if there's a child under the age of six, that doesn't happen that often as, as well. And uh, violations and vigorous enforcement of that aren't happening either. So things like that could go a long way. Um, when it comes to the construction dust issues that we face, landlords, landlords are supposed to pre-file in cases where they do major construction projects, supposed to pre-file with the Department of Health, let the Department of Health know they're going to do that kind of project so that they can come out and monitor things. Um, they almost never do that either, and the city doesn't take any issue with that at this point. So uh, the ineffectiveness of the past laws, Local Law 1 in, in particular, is basically because the regulations and enforcement are, are not really being done uh, sufficiently. Um, and on that note, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Liam. He's going to talk a little bit more about like what this looks like on the ground and what tenants face because of this. And uh, then we'll jump into some final recommendations. Sure. Um, so as Brandon mentioned, uh, so much of our work at Cooper Square uh, takes the form of what we call anti-displacement organizing, which uh, is where we're kind of working with uh, tenants to organize tenants associations or coalitions, which can <clears throat> sort of work to where tenants can work to collectively pressure management to resolve building issues on these you know, span from basic repairs and service outages to combating tenant harassment in all of its forms. And uh, luckily for us, this anti-displacement organizing uh, also informs a lot of our kind of issue-based campaigns. Um, so in neighborhoods like the Lower East Side, uh, where we've got kind of a, a hot real estate market um, and there are long-term rent regulated tenants living alongside you know market rate units that go for three or four times what uh, some rent regulated tenants would pay. Uh, landlords are kind of especially incentivized um, to harass rent regulated tenants out of their apartments in order to perform renovations uh, to you know deregulate the unit. Um, Brandon mentioned construction as harassment earlier, um, and this is kind of one form that harassment takes, um, and it occurs when landlords use dangerous or negligent work in order to harass tenants, um, threatening their physical and mental health and safety. Um, and unfortunately, uh, when proper safety measures are not taken in older buildings um, where they were you know, built before 1960, where the walls are very likely to contain lead-based paint, uh, tenant exposure to lead through construction dust becomes really like a kind of a toxic extension of uh, construction as harassment. Um, and through our, our work with tenants associations and groups like the Far Tenants Alliance, um, where tenants, uh, including young children across multiple buildings, were exposed to levels of lead hundreds of times beyond the legal limit um, through construction work while, work while unsafe work was performed in their building. Um, these tenants were you know, organized tenants associations and, you know, their larger kind of umbrella alliance and uh, worked with Cooper Square and their local elected officials uh, to utilize local media attention, uh, which kind of threw more attention to the issues that they were facing uh, and allowed tenants to hold their landlord a little bit more accountable. Um, this ultimately forced him uh, to create safe construction guidelines and custom work plans for all additional work that was to be performed in the building. Um, and also uh, held him to prop properly mitigate lead uh, for the rest of the period where the work was performed. Um, tenants there received rent abatements and a settlement totaling almost a quarter million dollars. Um, our, our work with this building and others that we've worked with in the years since kind of spurred Cooper Square and its membership to start uh, Lead Dust Free NYC in order to organize against lead exposure. Um, a more recent example is that of 336 West 17th Street, uh, where tenants alleged to have faced intense uh, tenant harassment and constructionist harassment, um, and folks were exposed to uh, lead dust beyond the legal limit. Um, 
However, with the help of kind of the education that uh, folks from the Lead Just Free NYC Coalition were able to provide them when they met up, um, they learned a lot more about their rights during construction um, and were able to, and eventually uh, when folks from that building decided to kind of hold a rally and press conference in front of their building, um, they also had stronger connections to local elected officials, um, you know, as a result of sort of navigating the city agencies. Um, the elected support in, in those instances where they were waiting to hear back from city agencies or getting results was really, uh, really useful. And um, I think elected officials really play a huge part um, in so much of like tenant or neighborhood organizing um, just by providing the inst institutional backing that they have access to. They can really kind of jumpstart the organizing, um, bring momentum to it in uh, instances where um, work might otherwise slow down. Um, and it, they, it's, and it's also, you know, really appreciated from the tenants. Um, something that, and it's something that we kind of wanted to highlight here. Um, you know, in addition to introducing great legislation, yeah, uh, we think it's really crucial for lo local elected officials to have uh, robust and you know, receptive uh, constituent services to, you know, protect their neighborhoods and serve as a resource for their constituents. Um, I think now, if we have time, we may discuss kind of uh, more further recommendations for future electeds or uh, legislation that we think may be uh, necessary from here. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Liam. I think you've already kind of started us down that track, but. Um, you know, I think working on the ground as we do in the Lower East Side with a lot of these lead contamination issues, <clears throat> it seems pr quite evident that the role of electeds in, in oversight capacity is crucial here. At this point, the agencies aren't really doing all they should be doing in many cases, uh, and the different systems that are in place are, are not serving uh, tenants like they should. So in, oversight is really important. I think, you know, to look at it as an opportunity to help the agencies to identify their shortcomings and become more effective in combating blood poisoning is, is crucial. Um, enforcement regu and regulatory changes are really kind of uh, the key to making the laws that are in place work. Um, we also see like collecting the fines and penalties is also a component of what needs to be improved on as well. Um, handing out the fines and penalties, but not doing, not collecting them in any way or collecting only a portion of them really uh, Kind of takes the legs out of the entire process of citing violations. So yeah, in closing, I think a handful of other things could really help out as well. Um, Liam has touched on, uh, you know, kind of doing uh, uh, deep and meaningful uh, community and uh, constituent services, uh, educational work that council members and other electeds can do through their position is important too. Not enough tenants really know the dangers of lead poisoning and what it looks like. Um, and you know, using uh, the powers within the, the process of nego negotiating the budget to make sure that the proper agencies uh, that are doing these work get the funding to do it. Um, any new law that is enacted um, is only as strong as the amount of, of folks you have on the ground doing the enforcement. So having these agencies be resourced enough to actually carry out things is really important as well. When it comes to legislation, I think it's honestly a point uh, worth contemplating whether we need more or not, or whether we just need more enforcement and regulatory reform. Um, uh, from our perspective, if any changes need to be made there, maybe it could be ones that strengthen um, the amounts of fines, penalties, and the prosecution of landlords to kind of wake up the industry, real estate, and uh, the construction industry to understand that this is a serious problem and has the uh, consequences of, of uh, you know, can leave children uh, sometimes irrevocably um, developmentally disabled, you know, as a result, it's something to be extremely careful of in the work they do in buildings and um, in the capacity of a landlord and a property manager keeping tabs on whether the units are um, in, in, in good shape and not existing with chipped and peeling paint. So uh, I think with that, we're pretty much at the end of our time and uh, we're going to hang on uh, towards the end of the presentation here to uh, take any questions we can, and uh, we can also be reached, uh, as Dr. Mark Woods mentioned about himself, through an e easy Google search of the Cooper Square Committee. You'll come up with uh, the uh, information to reach Lee MRI. But thank you so much for having us today.
Thank you, Brandon and Liam. And um, I think all of our panelists can come back. What we're gonna do while we look at, uh, we pull questions and thank you to all who have provided questions. We are gonna have one short poll. Um, so I think we can run that poll right now. It's very easy. It's two questions. So we'll give people a moment to um, respond to the, the poll question that we have. Um, and then we will get right into the questions. So thank you for folks who have submitted them. Give it just one moment. So we'll start with um, a question. I'm not sure who wants to take it, but we'll go with this. What can the city council do to better fight against lead exposure and poisoning in our city schools? Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Uh, okay, I will in the absence of anybody else. Um, the discovery that there is lead in the schools, in the city schools, both in the water and in the paint uh, really is, is a recent phenomenon uh, over the last uh, four years, I think, starting with water. Water being tested because of what happened in Flint, Michigan and how it hit the news and the water contamination um, for what they did there and, and, and the children who uh, ended up having higher blood lead levels as a consequence of, of drinking that water or attributed to that water. So, so that started a run of, of interest in water around the country and lo and behold, uh, when the city schools, as well as all the state schools were required to test uh, by the governor, uh, they found that uh, there was an enormous uh, number of schools that had lead in the water. In fact, the vast majority of schools had lead in the water, at least coming from, from one source. So um, that resulted in the requirement on, on an ongoing basis. Um, I'm not sure how often, I think every few years for schools um, to test uh, all of the faucets that will result in drinking water uh, within the schools. And if they find uh, lead above a certain threshold, then they're required to remediate, to fix it. The problem with that, and here comes the, the, the law issue, is what the standard is for how much lead is permissible in the water. The, the EPA sets the permissible amount of lead in water at 15 parts per billion, 15 micrograms per kilogram of water. <clears throat> that number was not chosen on a health basis. It was chosen on a convenience basis for the water companies who said, yeah, you won't break the bank. You won't break us. We can get down to a lead of 15. Um, but to get below that, you're, you're putting an onus on us that may be not our responsibility because it may not be our water. It may be the water that's traveling through the house's pipes, starting with the leaders from the main pipes under the streets. And we don't control that. We don't control if there's lead pipes there or lead solder or brass fixtures that have lead, all of which are contaminating the water. We just control the source and the mains. So, so don't make us responsible. 15 is a good number. We can, we can pay for that. We can do that. And there are offsets if you try to go lower. Uh, because as you put additives into the water to get rid of any lead contamination that might be there, you may be changing the chemical structure of the water that permits harmful organisms to thrive instead. So you're trading one problem for another. So it's a balancing act for the water companies. On the other hand, bottled water, FDA says, FDA or Consumer Safety Commission, I think, says it's five parts per billion, five micrograms per kilogram of water. So why is one standard five and the other 15? Well, the argument is kind of the same. The, the bottling companies say, well, we control all the water. So yeah, we can get down to five. We're, we're really responsible. We're not worried about contaminated pipes in the homes. We can do it. It's feasible. Yeah, and we're not so worried about the organisms for some reason for bottled water as we might be for water coming out of your tap. So there's a, an incongruity between the two standards from the federal agencies for what's permissible. The American Academy of Pediatrics, um, other organizations around the world, health organizations say five is too much. It should be one. Or why is there any lead in the water? There shouldn't be any. So in schools, the standard recommended is 20. And that's, they're too high. 20 is too much, 15 is too much, five is probably too much. 
We don't really know what it should be other than zero. Then we're sure there's no lead exposure from it. So for the schools, I would say that's the primary answer. The water has to be dealt with. The second answer has to do with the lead paint discovered more recently. We may have had 80 years of exposure to lead paint in our public schools. Maybe that long, maybe longer. Again, any school built before 1985 could still have lead based, probably has lead based paint in it. If the school uh, allows the inspection of that to happen once a year, twice a year, three times a year, then you could have a long period of time where kids are sitting in a classroom and conditions have changed. The paint is beginning to peel, it's crumbling. You have preschoolers in, in the public schools now. You have the kindergartners, the first graders. They're still hand to mouthers. If you're sitting on a carpet and you're over by the, the wall, uh, the chances are that you're touching surfaces that are gonna have lead dust and you're gonna be ingesting it. So what's not been mandated is the same kind of risk assessment as for homes by landlords is for the Department of Education. They do have a protocol for inspecting and correcting um, peeling paint violations in the classrooms. And it's uh, more rigorous in the last year since they got such a black eye in the news for having not done it in a rigorous way, uh, maybe ever. So having that enforced again, going back to uh, Brandon's point is, is again critical. We, we can have a law, but it has to be enforced. Uh, and second is that there was no determination by the Department of Education as to whether any of the kids who'd been sitting in those classrooms for years and years had ever been tested for their lead levels. So we don't know what the impact was. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> well, I have a good follow on question if someone else would like to take it. Um, is what is behind the lack of enforcement? Lack of staff, lobbying by landlords, lack of support for tenants making complaints? Um, Brandon or Liam, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, it's hard to say, um, but it is well known that uh, prior administrations didn't necessarily support the lead laws. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg attempted to veto the local law one when it was trying to pass city council and city council overturned it. So the administrations that are in place um, really do set the tone for what's going to happen here, right? And if they're not doing their job and if the people at the top are not saying this needs to be happening and this needs to be happening vigorously, uh, we need to get out there and we understand this is an inconvenience for landlords, but the consequences of it are devastating for families um, it needs to be done, um, then, you know, that can have a big impact on what happens. So um, there, I don't think there's anyone that really knows the absolute answer to that question, but I would say that it's, you know, the laws that are in place began during a different administration that um, I think we're not friendly towards the laws. And now we have moved on to this point and the law, the enforcement and other things are slowly changing, but this is really the result, I think, of a recent push and some of the reporting that Dr. Markowitz is talking about by Christopher Wirth, um, a lot of work that's going on in a coalition of groups throughout the city called uh, NICELP, New York City's Coalition to End Lead Poisoning, which is coming back together in a big way. And some, you know, additional, um, at this point, in, in an additional interest by the council to push bills, you know, in the last three to four years, there's been about 20 some new bills introduced by council members to try to look at what can be done here. Um, so I, I would say that it's a combination of things from, you know, the agencies having the budget to there being a kind of a culture within the administration and others, other places that could be doing more that just has not been broken down yet and has not been challenged appropriately. And we're working on trying to do that. Uh, but that, that would be my quick answer. So Taylor, this is a yet another follow on, but I think it's, it's um, you know, what can the council do or what can a council member do to bring about more enforcement? Can they hold meetings? Can they do inspections themselves? Can they hold hearings? What kind of activities do you think a council member could do that could help bring attention to this issue? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there are a lot of groups who are organizing around this, uh, who a lot of uh, tenants who haven't had their needs met or who haven't been listened to. Uh, I think especially about the, the work that uh, we've been doing with, uh, with NYSHA residents, there are a lot of folks who, um, who would uh, really need that support from, uh, from our council members. Maybe that's holding meetings, maybe that's listening to what folks are saying, um, but really bringing attention to, uh, to lead as an issue, especially in communities where um, folks are gonna be impacted, um, impacted first and worst. Uh, and I know that Brandon uh, and, and company might have some additional pieces to add, but um, that's a really big, uh, a really big part of this, right, is, is helping to apply pressure, especially if you represent folks who are going to be, uh, we talk about the health impacts, the communities who are going to be uh, impacted most heavily by these, uh, by these issues, but the folks are there and they may be your own constituents, right, so it's a fact of, of linking up with those folks and, and trying to actually mobilize uh, and, and and make things happen and working with community. I mean, I think, right, the main the main thing the council can do is, is use the bully pulpit, right, which we just talked about. That's a huge factor. You're more likely to get press um, than the average citizen is by and large. Um, but, you know, holding, holding the administration, whichever administration accountable and making sure that they're doing that. And that's where I, of course, suggested hearings, I have mean, come from an administrative agency I wasn't always a fan of, but um, certainly um, that's, it's a way to make sure that people are paying attention. And very often the agencies will, will change behavior um, to address those issues. Um, all right, we have time for one more question. Um, do the same standards hold for lead, um, hold for short-term rentals like Airbnb? I don't know the answer on that. Anyone? Liam, do you want to take this? I'm not sure. I think, I don't know if I saw you turn your mic on there. No? Um, I, can, I can take a quick stab. I, I think they do. I think all housing in New York is, um, the local law one applies to all housing in New York. And that short-term rentals are typically you know, many of them are actually illegal at this point, the way they're operated. <laughs> Airbnbs are not rented out in a way that is in alignment with the law, but they are units that are intended to be long-term rentals and the local laws all apply to them. Is that right, Dr. Merkowitz? Look like you were gonna answer. Yeah, well. so what I'm thinking of is that the, the law says a kid resides in a place for 10 hours a week. So that's the determinant. If you're going to stay in an Airbnb for 24 hours, that's already 10 hours for that week. Theoretically, it should fall under the law in that way. It doesn't say it's got to be week after week. It just says 10 hours in a week, you've resided there. Uh, I don't see any enforcement of that ever happening. But yes, I think it should be covered. Okay. Well, that wraps our panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, to Dr. Markowitz, to Liam, to Taylor, to Brandon. Um, that was really terrific and uh, informative. And there's more work to do on lead. So don't you worry, you council candidates, we will be sure to have uh, bills for you to work on um, moving forward. So thank you. Um, that does conclude our panel on lead. We are going to move on to our panel on parks and open space. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Be safe out there. You too. Yeah, thanks. Parks are one of our most vital environmental assets. They provide access to nature, expand green space, and help fight climate change. Our urban tree canopy removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and provides shade, which saves energy by lowering the temperature. They also support biodiversity by providing food and shelter for wildlife. And New York City's parks contribute to our resiliency by capturing almost 2 billion gallons of stormwater runoff. Unfortunately, the Parks Department receives less than 1% of the total city budget, leaving our green spaces under threat. And that budget gap, gap grew even more during last year's budget, even though the only thing you could do last spring, summer, and fall was go to a park. Um, along with our partners at New Yorkers for Parks, we are advocating for parks to get our fair share. Uh, we, along with many others, are part of a coalition called Playfair for Parks. Um, to hear more about this issue, please welcome our first panelist, who is Emily Walker. Uh, 
Emily manages New York manages New Yorkers for Parks relationships with park and garden advocates and friends of parks groups throughout New York City and oversees New Yorker New York yeah, New Yorkers for Parks government relations and advocacy work engaging decision makers organizational partners like us and everyday New Yorkers in advancing the cause of open space and citywide funding prior to joining NY for P Emily was research assistant to Tom Hayden and helped facilitate the incorporation of the Peace and Justice Resource Center, which is a not-for-profit research organization founded by Mr. Hayden. She had internships at the Eastern Environmental Law Center in Newark, New Jersey, and the East Los Angeles Office of former Los Angeles County Supervisor, Gloria Molina. She also has experience working in grassroots community outreach in both LA and the Hunt Points neighborhood in South Bronx. She is truly bi-coastal. So Emily, over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Julie. And I want to thank the league for inviting NY4P to be a part of tonight's panel. Um, pleasure to be here. So I'm going to give some kind of high level context for where we are with parks. And I'm joined by some really fantastic co-panelists this evening. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So as Julie mentioned, I'm Emily Walker. I'm the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. Um, New Yorkers for Parks is the only independent citywide organization that advocates for quality parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. Um, along with our friends at the League, we're the co-founders of the Playfair Coalition, which Julie mentioned, and that's a multi-year campaign that we have that's dedicated to seeking more robust funding for New York City's parks. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. And before we dive right into the challenges that are facing our park system um, and, and what we need to do to achieve a robust and equitable park system, I think we need to be clear about the basic fact that parks are critical city infrastructure and we need to treat them as such. Um, this might seem like an indisputable statement, but it's certainly something that I think many of us as New Yorkers take for granted. And the reality is that our city government hasn't reflected this fundamental truth in policy for, for decades. Um, so we really want to outline clearly that the policies we're discussing tonight are critical because parks provide significant social, environmental, and economic benefits to New York City. Um, I think it's more clear than ever that the past year has shown us the importance of parks as open community spaces that foster physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being. They also provide indispensable ecosystem services and environmental benefits that make our city more resilient to the impacts of global warming and climate change. I know my co-panelist Sarah is going to speak a lot about the role that natural areas play in this work. Um, green spaces support carbon capture, stormwater mitigation, and lessening the heat island effect of big cities like New York. They really are essential. Um, and finally, parks are a driver of economic growth and development. While maintained parks are key ingredients to thriving neighborhoods, and they have a significant impact on neighborhood land values and attracting investment to communities. I do want to note, however, that the city needs to ensure that well-maintained parks are the standard and not the exception, because I think history shows us that disparate park conditions and investments have led to gentrification and displacement. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide. So NY4P has a deep appreciation for the work that our city has done to maintain the array of open spaces that you see on the slide here. This is just an overview of you know, the various amenities that, that parks include in the city of New York. Um, the good news is that we have the foundation to build a 21st century park system and, and seeing just the, the varied assets that we have available to us as New Yorkers, I think on the slide, it makes that really clear. The challenge, however, is that when the city park system comprises 30,000 acres or 14% of the city's land, we have this huge amount of space to maintain and enhance. Um, and we're not seeing the funding that, that is needed to, to make sure that that investment is protected. Um, and you know, I think the other thing to note is that while this might seem like a lot of open space, we know that it's also actually not enough to meet the needs of our communities today. And it's not equally accessible, which we'll talk about um, in just a moment. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So I think you know one thing that's important for folks to know is that effective parks policy is driven not solely by the parks department, but by a number of different groups and constituencies that include the agency as well as nonprofit partners um, like grassroots stewardship organizations and larger conservancies like the Central Park Conservancy, the Bronx River Alliance, our friends at the Natural Area Conservancy who are with us um, tonight. The parks conservancies and friends of groups that really make up this vast array um, and the large number of volunteer New Yorkers who show up to care for open spaces, there are so many key players that need to be engaged in any successful effort to improving our green infrastructure. Um, and it's the communities who use our spaces most that are in many cases most directly responsible for parks care in the long term, especially through volunteer efforts. And these organizations need a seat at the decision making table when it comes to setting the agenda on the parks 
So we really encourage candidates to make sure that they're focusing on those groups. Um, next slide. All right, so we've talked about why we love and need our park system and we've given kind of a brief lay of the land, no pun intended, but now we wanna talk about the challenges that we face as a city. Um, so I'm gonna go to the next slide. So to be sure, parks have not been immune to the disruption of the pandemic. Um, it's important to acknowledge that our city has been neglecting our parks and green spaces for a long time. The challenges we face predate this, this current budget cycle that we're within and we really can't afford to do this any longer as a city. Um, the Center for an Urban Future did research in 2018 that found that at that point in time, the city had a $6 billion backlog in deferred maintenance. And we know that that's only going to become a costlier issue with every year that we don't come up with solutions. Ignoring the problem is not a solution. Um, the Parks Department must be held accountable, but we also have to acknowledge that the agency can't be expected to do more with less. The agency rarely has had the funding or the staffing resources it needs to properly do its job, and that's been the case for decades. Um, and historic neglect isn't just an issue of deferred maintenance or underfunding the agency responsible for our parks. It's also a failure of vision and a failure to adapt. Despite the huge population growth and increased community needs across the city, most of our parks are less than one acre in size and many communities don't have the park space they need. The next slide. So um, my friend Carter from the Trust for Public Land is going to go into a little more detail on this, but we wanted to take a moment to just put New York's park system, um, you know, and it, its challenges into perspective to look at some other major cities across the country. Um, we're trailing well behind Minneapolis, DC, Arlington, Cincinnati, Portland, San Francisco, when it comes to serious city commitment to funding and building green infrastructure and robust inclusive park systems. Um, and it's it's essential to say that one of the most glaring problems with New York parks as we think about solutions from the next city council and mayor is that New Yorkers don't have equal access to these spaces that are so foundational to community health and prosperity. Um, and, you know, finally, I want to note that low income New Yorkers and black New Yorkers don't have equal access to parks and open space in our city and that needs to change. Next slide. So COVID has really deepened the historic inequities and broader issues of inequity that I've been outlining so far. And you know, the brutal irony is that just as New Yorkers love and need for their parks reached its apex this past year when parks became havens for safe socializing and escape from quarantine for so many New Yorkers, and the agency that's tasked with maintaining this land lost 14% of its budget. Um, we believe a budget is a statement of priorities and handling, handing the second largest budget cut to parks is a really telling sign of our city's lack of urgency in setting an effective, let alone bold agenda for our green infrastructure. Um, and on top of that, the city has functionally pressed pause on nearly $1 billion worth of parks projects, many of which are shovel ready. Um, these are issues we think of bureaucracy working against us at a crucial moment and a failure of political will to step up for the spaces that New Yorkers are really laying on. Um, so next, I'm going to go on to talking quickly about how we can begin to address some of these challenges. So I'll have you advance the slides. Uh, one more. So in this section, we're going to talk about the, what we need long term, but also what the immediate um, urgent priorities are that we think could be taken to mitigate the worst impacts of COVID and the deterioration of many of our parks over the last year. First and foremost, we need to restore the parks budget. We can't expect the agency to do more than less. This is a really strong statement that the council and mayor can make um, and testifying to a more equitable recovery for the city. Um, and along with the budget, we also need to ensure that parks employees jobs are secure and just as important that the thousands of New Yorkers who came out to volunteer on behalf of their parks this past year are set up for success. Um, finally, we need to address the procurement freeze and get, get the hundreds of shovel ready parks projects moving because our communities need them more than ever and they will help serve our recovery ultimately. Next slide. So if we could get all of the items I just laid out done, that would be a great start toward energizing a robust park policy. But we also need to look at the longer term vision and strategy. That means again, looking at our budget as a statement of priorities and comparing the half of 1% that we allocate to parks with the one to 2% that most other major cities across the country are devoting to their park systems. We also need to pursue alternative funding sources so that we can have a realistic plan for tackling the $6 billion in deferred maintenance expenditures that we have. And we need to just hammer home the point yet again that the we need to to support the New Yorkers who are turning out every day to volunteer in their parks. Next slide. 
Um, so, you know, you'll see some of the items here that we think, you know, would help achieve a more equitable parks ecosystem. Um, we've been approaching parks improvements in such a piecemeal way, and that's why we've ended up with so many discrepancies. And communities need to not be left to fund for themselves. We need a citywide plan in place that will prioritize park enhancements across the boroughs. And we'll also make sure that, you know, communities that have been overlooked for a long time are not having to fight for those, those improvements to be made. It must be an equity-driven approach um, around communities needs. And um, I'm going to have you move to the next slide in the interest of time. So um, with this, I know I tried to go through a lot. There's so much depth that uh, my co-panelists are going to give. I wanted to just briefly highlight the resources that New Yorkers for Parks has available, as well as some of the research that we draw upon from some of our peer organizations at the Center for an Urban Future, the Trust for Public Land. Um, and, you know, I encourage you all to reach out to New Yorkers for Parks. We're a resource for you all as you are, you know, going through the campaign. And we want to ensure that we're helping collectively to make sure that parks and open spaces uh, don't get left behind. So thank you for your time. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to my friends at the League. Thank you so much. Don't you worry. We won't let them forget. I assure you there are questions about parks in our questionnaire. Um, uh, and our next panelist is Carter Strickland. Um, as New York State Director for the Trust for Public Land, also known as TPL since 2017, Carter leads a team that protects open space and builds parks and playgrounds around New York. Prior to working at the TPL, he served in many roles over a 25 year career, including as part of the city's sustainability team and as commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, where he launched the New York City Green Infrastructure Program, the New York City Clean Heat Initiative, the New York City Wastewater Resiliency Plan, led the agency's response to hurricanes Irene and Sandy, and oversaw programs related to infrastructure planning and construction, water quality, air quality, climate change, land use, ecological restoration, and energy. Carter. Thank you, Julie, and I want to thank um, the League and, and uh, the League staff, Carlos and the team, for putting together this great panel and elevating uh, both lead poisoning, which is really important, and uh, parks um, for the benefit of our next political leadership class. Um, so, and I want to thank Emily for um, her overview and, and uh, all the work that they do together with uh, League of Conservation Voters on the Playfair campaign, which we're a, a proud member of uh, and very much support. I'm going to pick up on uh, a few of the elements that, um, uh, and expand on a few of the elements that uh, Emily introduced. Uh, one of which is um, just the overall benefits of parks and where we stand uh, in New York City, and then also on uh, building new parks and playgrounds where they're needed most. Um, you know, on the first issue, if we zoom out, where does New York City stand? You know, we uh, you know rightly think we're the we're the tops in many cases. It's not true for our park system. We've got tremendous park. We've got great historic assets. But if you zoom out, and, and Trust for Public Land publishes every May. Uh, a benchmarking report against the top 100 cities in the country uh, and looks at a number of metrics. We look at access to parks. We measure it by 10 minute walk. New York actually has a, its own standard, but the 10 minute walk standard is one we apply across the country. We look at overall park acreage. We look at um, investments uh, in the park system and we look at amenities. Um, uh, what's in the parks when you get there is it attractive. And overall on balance, um, New York has been, um, uh, is, is now number 11 in our last year's uh, report. Um, I actually don't even know where we're going to stand this year, so we might move up or down uh, a point or two. Um, you know, but clearly there's some strengths. Those strengths include um, uh, a vast network, as, as um, Emily mentioned, 1,700 uh, uh, park uh, areas. Um, that means that about 99% of New Yorkers are within 10 minute walk of a park, which is great. Um, sometimes those parks are small though. So in terms of um, uh, uh, acreage per person, uh, uh, New York is less than other park systems uh, across the country. And uh, in terms of amenities and we pull out playgrounds, uh, there just aren't enough. It's, uh, you know, we're ranking the 32nd percentage there. So there's strengths and there's rooms for, room for improvement. Um, next slide, please. You know, and why do we care about this? I guess, you know, the main thing is you can't have a great city without great parks um, and not just one great park, but a great park in every neighborhood. Um, and, you know, and, it, and it's very possible. This is, uh, I've, I've got two slides here of projects we've done over the last few years and open, and you can see that 
what we're turning is the, you know, the before picture is just an asphalt schoolyard, um, not attractive, not conducive to use. Um, and when we invest in it, uh, you get what's below, which is a, a functioning piece of the city that adds value to the whole block, really in the whole neighborhood. Um, these we make open to the um, neighborhood after school hours and on the weekends. Um, and it's got a number of features like these trees that will grow up just like the kids. And uh, these trees will provide even more shade when they grow up. Uh, new equipment to use, um, a versatile turf field and courts, uh, things of that nature. Next slide, please. You know, same thing here. And this, uh, this features uh, some beautiful artwork as well. Um, you know, and these can be customized to um, reflect what the communities want, but um, it, what's really important is how they just pull together the community and parks really are our social space. Um, you know, it's where we meet other New Yorkers. It's where we strengthen those social bonds and those social bonds, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say, are lifesavers. There's been many studies going back to um, what happened in uh, Chicago uh, back in 1995 during a heat wave and those communities that had strong social ties had more survivors uh, in those communities where unfortunately at that time elderly people died of heat um, uh, were those neighborhoods that had all the same social characteristics but but in terms of demographics income and the like but had uh, social bonds that were not as strong so building these third places the first place being work Second, traditionally, second place being home. The first and second places are the same these days for many of us. Um, and a third place where we can meet our neighbors. We can meet uh, people who aren't neighbors, who aren't our friends, and we can get to know uh, in New Yorkers from new, different neighborhoods, uh, maybe even better, um, and can mix, much like the subway. So um, that's the social strength and community strength of parks. Next slide, please. Parks are critical to public health. We know that now. Uh, we've always known it. There's a lot of research out there. Um, you know, in the U.S., the strongest determinant of life expectancy is where people live uh, and their socioeconomic status. Um, and we know that uh, low-income neighborhoods and communities of color um, are affected by poor health outcomes and also lack uh, open space. They're connected. Uh, the more places you provide to exercise uh, and just get outside, uh, the more people use them. And there's measurable benefits uh, across a number of uh, health metrics. Next slide, please. And so investing in, well, they decide, investing in parks is not just an investment in the wellness of our citizens, but in, uh, in the wellness and resiliency of our entire city. So climate resilience, really critical. Um, you know, we know that a lot of uh, students and people attend neighborhoods where there's not a lot of green space and it's hot it's really, really hot. Um, you know, we've measured um, in places in Oakland, for example, um, believe it or not, well over 120 degrees at uh, three feet high above the ground, which is about a kid's head height um, in an asphalt neighborhood. So it can really focus heat. The more we green that, the more shade we provide, uh, the healthier our kids are going to be. And the same is true for, um, for stormwater. So you can see here a cutaway of one of our projects, and this can be done in, in any park. Um, where it absorbs stormwater. And that means it doesn't run off and that means our waterways are cleaner. Um, and this is true for natural parks as well, by the way, this is a, uh, an engineered and built park uh, uh, renovation, but those parks where there's natural areas that are well-maintained do also absorb stormwater. Next slide, please. Uh, we know that there's outdoor learning that's really happening and critical, next slide. You can see here, kids get in touch with nature. Um, so I wanna talk, well, thank you. Yeah, please do advance. Um, just to plant a seed of an idea because we have a great park system, but we don't have to accept our legacy park system. Just like every other piece of critical infrastructure in the city, it can and should grow with our city. Um, and you know, we believe that New York City can get to number one in the park system through a few measures. Um, you know, one is just getting to 100% like Boston and San Francisco for the 10 minute walk score. We got to reach 75,000 people. We've mapped out 70 parks where that can happen. Uh, a second way is just to build more playgrounds. Um, we can do it. Uh, we only have 2.1 playgrounds per uh, 10,000 people. And it's, it's, it's in the 32nd percentage. We can build more of these. Uh, a few years ago, uh, two administrations ago, there was a commitment to build 290. Uh, it wasn't fully realized. We think there's a few hundred more to go. 
Um, um, and thirdly, and most importantly, build more park space in high need neighborhoods. We know that black and brown neighborhoods, low income neighborhoods have much less park space. Um, and our those parks are accommodating more people. That was critical in COVID when people were um, you know, crushed into common spaces where they wanted to go. Next slide, please. Here's where they are. You can see it's a little hard to see, but you know they're clustered in the places where you would expect North Staten Island, uh, the Bronx, um, you know Brooklyn, South Brooklyn, and uh, Eastern Queens. Next slide, please. You know how do you get there? Um, you know we know, and there's a recent report. I'm happy to provide the link to folks that investments in parks is also an investment in jobs, and those are another thing that we need short term. So. Parks are critical for the long-term health of the city, but they're also important uh, for our short-term economic recovery. Um, we think uh, that certainly the op baseline operating budget should be increased to at least 1% of the city budget, uh, given all the important role that, that parks play. It's not too much. It's now at 0.6%, uh, and that's really shameful, and it's often the first cut. On the capital side, we think there's a lot of room to uh, find investments for parks that will translate to good paying jobs. Um, there's a recent study that showed that uh, had the state move forward on a $3 billion bond measure that would have leveraged uh, about 6.7 billion in overall project funding from different sources and created 65,000 jobs. On the city level, there's new federal funding and new programs. Um, and something called the Great American Outdoors Act and the Outdoor Recreation Leadership Program that do dedicate federal funding for local parks. It's really critical as investments. There's state funding, um, some new city funding, but importantly, and I wanna focus on this, money and process savings from, uh, from streamlining how we build parks. If we do more design build, if we're smarter about how we build parks, then we can, then we can save more and gain more uh, uh, through efficiency savings. Um, so with that, next slide, please. Great, I'm done. So I wanna thank you for, for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Carter. That was great. This is a lovely picture, by the way. Um, our next panelist is Sarah Charlotte Powers. Sarah draws on her background in land use planning, economics and environmental management and her work as executive director and co-founder of the Natural Areas Conservancy. While working as a planner at Jonathan Rose Companies, she was the lead project manager for the creation of a new management entity for the South Bronx Greenway, where she focused on the creation of local revenue streams. Sarah worked for seven years as the parks manager for Sheena Cutson, managing 15 parks, and has also worked as a consultant for NYSERDA, the New York City Department of Trans Transportation, and the Mohawk Preserve. So she has a lot of experience in this space. So Sarah, over to you. Thanks so much, Julie. And um, I want to just uh, echo my fellow panelists in thanking the League and thanking all of the attendees this evening. So because I am um, presenting on a, a part of the city's parks portfolio that some folks um, listening tonight may not be familiar with, I'm going to use a little bit of my time just to set the stage and make sure that folks understand what I mean when I describe natural areas and why natural areas are both critically important um, for the vision of uh, equitable and resilient New York City and also um, how they really can serve as a low hanging fruit for solving many complex problems that are uh, adjacent to, but not um, fully within the parks space. Next slide. So just to set the lay of the land a little bit, as a lifelong New Yorker, I was really surprised when I learned that 40% of the land cover of New York City is green. And within that, almost 12% is natural habitats, the kinds of places that you might imagine in large state parks or um, in coastal areas on Long Island or on the Jersey Shore. But these places exist right here within the five boroughs and 50% of New York City's natural areas representing one third of our city's park system um, are under the jurisdiction of the parks department and the city. Next slide. So I wanted to just give kind of a, 
a high level overview of some of the reasons why natural areas are really important um, today and for the future. And the first of those is quality of life. Next slide. So um, both Emily and Carter touched on this a little bit, but natural areas are really the lungs and um, gardens of our city. They play a really outsized role in improving our local and also our, our broader air quality in providing cooling, addressing things like urban heat island. Um, large natural areas serve as heat sinks for surrounding neighborhoods, so they play a different but important role that complements the role of street trees. And our natural areas also play a really critical role in absorbing stormwater and helping us to reduce localized flooding. Next slide. Um, natural areas also serve a really important role in making our city more resilient for folks who lived in New York during um, Superstorm Sandy, but also for folks who spend time in neighborhoods like Broad Channel, even on uh, days when there's just a light rainstorm. Next slide. Um, you'll know that our wetland areas play a really important role in protecting our neighborhoods and road and transportation infrastructure from localized flooding. And we also know that our natural areas play an outsized role, and this is based on new research just from last year that our organization conducted. 85% of the carbon sequestered in trees in New York City is sequestered within New York City parkland in forest patches, and healthy forests in our city store three times more carbon than degraded forests. So they really play this outsized role in not just helping our city to adapt to threats of climate change, but also mitigating the underlying um, emissions that our city produces. Next slide. And um, natural areas also have, I would say, a really huge opportunity <laughs> to be a source of equity and access in our city. So as I mentioned, a third of our city's park system is natural areas, forests, and wetlands. And it's somewhat shocking that as we enter 2021, we do not have consistent public access, including trail standards for the condition and design of trails. We lack consistent signage and wayfinding on trails in natural areas. And we also do not have currently um, a uniform system for mapping and providing access um, digitally and in paper form for people who want to visit our natural areas. So as we think about opportunities to increase access to parkland, we have a um, huge opportunity to unlock 10,000 acres of existing parkland and to really maximize those benefits. And I'll add that research that we conducted in 2014 showed that 50% of New Yorkers experience nature only in their city parks. And in COVID, during COVID, we went back and resurveyed park visitors and found that there was a 65% increase in visitation to natural areas. So I invite folks who are listening today to think about as we think about expanding access to playgrounds and plazas and neighborhood parks, we also, I think, have a moral imperative to make sure that people have access to places where they can spread out, experience quiet, experience the awe of nature. And we know that for half of our city's population, that will either happen on our city parks or it won't happen at all. And we have a huge opportunity to meet that need by investing in these places. Next slide. Oh. Sorry, next, yes. So um, I say here, luckily we have plans. Our organization working closely with dozens of partners have recently completed long range plans. So 25 to 30 year plans that are um, heavily informed by both um, scientific research, ecological research, but also focus groups, meetings and extensive community engagement that lay out roadmaps for the care and investment in each of these major systems. So seven over 7,000 acres of forests, um, over 4,000 acres of coastal and inland wetlands, and a plan to create uniform and high quality access to over 300 miles of nature trails. Next slide. 
Um, so how do we make this a reality? This mirrors many of the things that Emily and Carter highlighted in their presentations. We have a real opportunity, as I've said, to prioritize the care and access to natural areas as a win-win for addressing climate change and also for addressing equity issues in our city. There's policy changes needed to um, fully care for forests and wetlands, including updates to regulatory and um, zoning laws. And those recommendations, as I've mentioned, are also outlined in the three plans that I've described and happy to chat with folks about those um, changes. There's a need for not just an increase in funding, but also uh, consistency in the commitment of funding. Um, forest management was one of the things that was funded in the um, 2020, FY 2020 Playfair budget, but this is a multi-year, even multi-decade type of work, and it's very hard to successfully implement um, positive change with one-shot funding that only lasts a year or two. We need the kind of 10-year capital investments that we've seen for other types of large infrastructure improvements. And then I'll highlight here that the scoping that we've done outlines the creation of over 300 new jobs um, through the care of these places. And these are high quality jobs and also jobs that have a lot of transferable skills into the fields of conservation and horticulture. And I think are critically important to both provide the training and then the job security needed to really get this work done. Next slide. Um, and with that, I, I think I'll give a, a minute to the next panelist, but I'll say thank you so much for this time and I look forward to answering questions in the Q&A. You might be the first panelist in three days of panels to end with. <laughs> Congratulations. You're welcome. <laughs> Our final panelist is uh, Masoom Moitra. Masoom is a community urban planner, architect, educator, and artist currently working as director of El Puente's Greenlight District which is an initiative in holistic self-determination and community human rights in the rapidly gentrifying and historically environmental justice neighborhoods of South Williamsburg and Bushwick. As an independent consultant, Masoom has, has been recruited by communities across New York to develop participatory plans and frameworks that center equity and inclusivity. As part of Hester Street, she co-led community engagement of over 180,000 New Yorkers across five boroughs in the development of the first ever comprehensive cultural plan for New York for the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Masoom. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you, Sarah, for that extra minute because I feel like I'm going to need it. And thank you all the panelists. These were uh, really great presentations. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, parks in the context of environmental justice um, and why we need a very targeted parks um, approach when it comes to EJ neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm going to dig a deep, a little deeper into the word equity uh, because, uh, you know, El Puente has been doing this work in equity for almost 40 years now. Um, and because it's a very popular word now, so really look uh, into what that uh, means um, to the everyday life of um, an environmental justice community. So next slide, please. So El Puente is a community human rights institution uh, that promotes leadership for peace and justice. And it's been around since 1982. It was founded by Luis Garden Acosta, uh, Gino Maldonado and Francis Lucerna, who is now our president. Uh, next slide, please. El Puente has a long legacy of environmental justice and was one of the pioneers in the early um, environmental justice um, wins and struggles in Brooklyn and in New York City. Um, it was also the co-founder of New York City's Environmental Justice Alliance and won many early struggles like the uh, shutting down the development of a 55 story incinerator um, and a nuclear waste facility. And in the 90s, we also conducted a very large scale asthma study, which was actually one of the first um, community led um, uh, citizen science asthma projects that had actually been published in a, a medical health journal. This is important because uh, those issues since the 90s that were documented at that time haven't yet changed if uh, the asthma levels have only gone worse. And I'll be talking a little bit about that today. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Green Light District, of which uh, I'm the director of, uh, is an initiative in holistic and self-determination centered 
community development and urban planning. And I encourage like all candidates to really um, look at this and consider this approach towards looking at problems, including air quality, parks, equity, you know, uh, lead uh, poisoning, all of these issues, uh, the way we have looked at, at it in the past, which is through a framework of holism, like connecting issues to each other, looking at it in a very holistic way, and by putting the power of development and leadership in the hands of residents and acknowledging residents of communities that have undergone these issues for ages as um, leaders and as knowledge holders and as problem solvers. Um, and uh, next slide, please. For the last couple of years, we've been focusing on a campaign towards improving air quality because uh, air pollution has really been one of the biggest environmental justice issues in Southside Williamsburg. Um, in Bushwick as well, but the focus is mainly right now in this presentation on, on Southside Williamsburg. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about our campaign and also about the issue and how it affects um, open spaces. Um, the, one, some, one of the main causes of air pollution in this neighborhood is that there's a lot of transportation infrastructure and a lot of it, of course, has a racist legacy. Um, the Moses era uh, infrastructure like the BQE, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And in this map, you can see that the BQE is actually cutting through most of the green spaces, open spaces in the community, which means some of the youngest members um, and seniors in the community are actually exposed to some of the most toxic levels um, of, of polluted air. Um, and there, are, there there's also the entrance to Williamsburg Bridge, uh, the bus depot. It's a heavy truck route because uh, that goes to waste facilities that are close by. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And as was uh, told by some of our previous panelists, there's also severe lack of green and open spaces that can actually mitigate some of the most damaging effects of air pollution. Next slide, please. So um, as a result, and this is really the biggest moral fail failure that hasn't been addressed in decades, in spite of our partnerships with elected, in spite of so much work and advocacy around it, that the rates of asthma related hospitalizations are double those of Brooklyn and New York City overall. We know that this is an issue of equity and systemic racism because uh, sources of pollution are most likely to be cited in communities of color and cutting through open spaces. Next slide, please. Um, also, uh, we've done, like as a part of this campaign, we did a citizen science youth-led uh, air monitoring study that actually um, showed that, um, you know, some of, in some of our parks, the uh, air quality at its peak, it's like four to six times more than what's recommended. Um, and even though the air quality around the city has improved um, reasonably, um, it hasn't improved at the same rate in communities like ours. And we find this extremely alarming and questionable. And in fact, asthma rates have been only increased with time. Um, next slide, please. With COVID-19, as Emily has also mentioned, things have become even more uh, drastic because COVID has hit communities of color and Latino and African communities uh, even worse. And most, and you know, the communities that we represent are mainly Latino and African-American, low-income and moderate-income communities. Um, a recent Harvard study also showed that people who live in communities with higher air pollution are more likely uh, to face the deadliest impacts of COVID. And it leads to, among other chronic illnesses, um, it leads to short, shorter life expectancy. So I think that's a good reminder of the fact that not having enough mitigation infrastructure like parks actually reduces the lifespans of people in our community. Next slide, please. So I wonder, talking, going back to the uh, question of equity, um, I want to talk about why it is that we need a very targeted approach in EJ communities like ours. Um, I was attending a seminar the other day, um, uh, you know, co-hosted by one of our panelists about uh, about uh, what's happening with the park's budget 
um, after COVID hit and what the plan is for the future. And one of the uh, one thing that I learned was that a big part uh, of the strategy for parks maintenance is going to be focused on volunteerism. Um, and, you know, we always question that because even the volunteerism is excellent, very robust strategy and our communities have a history of actually taking control of uh, how clean our parks and doing it ourselves. But unfortunately, because it's that's more so the case in um, when it comes post uh, to post COVID era, but we have so many essential workers in our community. We have so many people with multiple jobs. We don't have the same volunteer capital that wealthier communities do. And which means that our parks are never as well maintained. And nor can we have programs like open streets because, you know, and, and there's been a documented inequity in how open spaces are distributed. Or one, and one of the reasons is that now, in response to that, uh, someone um, uh, said uh, one of the comments was that um, that park, the parks department has actually had a very equitable approach to the way playgrounds in the city are maintained, and uh, and um, and it was said that all playgrounds really receive the same amount of attention. Now, when I brought that back to community members who have grown up in parks in the community since they were kids, it it was a laughable thing, you know, because. Um, we 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 actually conducting oral history interviews right now with residents to document the condition of parks in the neighborhood, but also what uh, their con uh, the condition of air quality. Um, and uh, really, the the uh, one of the parents I was just listening to one of them today, and one of the parents said that there's and and this has been repeated again and again by community members. There is not a single park at walking distance that they can actually do go to during COVID, before COVID. And uh, especially, you know, at the times when we needed the most, people have to commute to other parts of Brooklyn, um, Manhattan, even other parts of North Brooklyn, and it's not easy to commute anymore. So even within North Brooklyn, there's an inequity in how parks are maintained. Uh, so we really want to say that, uh, and even if all parks were maintained the same way, when we talk about equity, we are trying to say that more resources need to be directed to communities that have been neglected historically, but also communities with environmental justice issues like poor air quality, because we need a different, a different set of tools. We need green walls, we need air purifying trees, we need more ground cover. We need a whole different kind of approach when it comes to improve parks improvement, and that is really equity. Um, when it comes, can you go to the next slide, please? When it comes to equity, we also want to tie it to self-determination. So it's not just enough to increase the park's budget. It's also very important that when money goes into a certain community, that you work with um, the uh, with people who and organizations that have been doing this work for um, decades, and that uh, we are looking at solutions that are actually uh, being developed from the ground. And all of us, all EJ communities, have platforms. We already have. Uh, plans which we have worked on with technical expert, experts, with our elected partners, with, uh, uh, with you know, academic partners. We already have the solutions in hand and we want you to come to us, look at our platforms and um, help us implement it. We don't want to, uh, you to come up with the solution. We want you to come, us, come to us and ask us for, um, you know, how can we implement these things because we can't do it alone and we need your help with implementing it. Uh, so we want to, the main thing is that we want equity to be tied in with self-determination and we want to look at parks as mitigation and public health tools, not just as recreational tools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one example of self-determination is the RN West Rire campaign. And you can see that there are many different aspects to it because again, when you allocate budget and when you do a public input process, it's not just about having one or two input sessions. We want long-term engagement with the community. We want to really honor the leadership of community members and the knowledge of that. And we need awareness raising campaigns because uh, when you go to the park and you talk to any other parent, almost half the people don't even know that their children are breathing in some of the most toxic air in the city. So at a hand in hand with parks improvement goes awareness raising, especially when it comes to EJ communities. So you can just quickly go through the next few slides um, which is really about how we really uh, depend on uh, citizens and our young people to lead some of these studies. Um, next slide, please. And we also use arts and culture a lot to make sure that the everyday person is able to give their input on how parks are 
can be improved, how air quality can be improved, uh, but also we are able to spread the word about what the problem is. You can quickly go through the next slides, please. So these are just uh, some examples of how we have been advocating around this issue. And uh, we've been doing a lot of community forums. And if you can stop here. So these are this is really the five point action platform. And then again, we encourage everyone to go and review this platform um, and really look at the way in which we have come up with five very distinct and holistic measures for uh, how we can um, start making uh, make, taking action on this problem and improving it. And each of these uh, now have a task force and a working group, um, which you know we invite you to join to help us actually uh, implement some of these solutions. Next slide, please. Many of these solutions, like for example, we want to um, propose that there should be green walls that separate like infrastructure like BQE from parks that they're cutting through. And this is like an issue of reparations, right? Because uh, the BQE was not built with the consent of the neighborhoods of color and communities of color through which it cuts through. So there is a duty of the city to be able to take control of, uh, uh, of people's health and how uh, what the impacts have been. So there are many barriers, like, for example, we haven't been able to identify what is the jurisdiction under which green walls can actually be built. Do we go to the DOT? We, when we talk to the DOT, we are sent to parks, parks sends us to the borough commissioner. So there is um, there's so many barriers that we encounter when we try to implement uh, many of these things. So we need your help with also figuring out what these barriers are because we are not seeing our community just at the south side. We are seeing it as an example of an EJ community where we can, we can actually have some wins and we can scale that up to EJ communities all around the city. Uh, so with that, I'll just end the presentation and I'll say that the main takeaway should be um, that equity and self-determination go hand in hand. And uh, you know, this is not the only platform, there are many platforms around the city and we would love to work with you to implement these solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Masoom. That was tremendous. Um, I want to remind everybody that you can submit uh, questions through the Q&A function. Um, and we have another poll for you. So if we want to run that poll right now, this is a one question poll. So it should be very um, quick to respond to. Um, trying to get information about what, what constituents care about on these various environmental issues. So. Um, thank you for your participation in that. We will give a moment. And then again, if folks want to submit questions, we are happy to take them. We'll give it just one moment. Okay. Um, one question we have is the city has embraced public private partnerships and outside groups to fund and maintain a lot of the public park system, um, such as Central Park Conservancy, Prospect Park Alliance, Bryant Park Corporation, Friends of the High Line. Um, should electeds look at returning more public control and funding for public parks? And how might one go about doing that when the allure of funding, uh, alternative funding is uh, so popular. Um, I'm happy to maybe kick things off with this one and um, I would welcome my co-panelists as well. I think, you know, for New York Mr. Parks, our perspective is that um, the nonprofit partners that steward specific parts like the conservancies and alliances mentioned in the question um, are actually providing a, a real benefit to the city and that you know, the fact that there are these nonprofit institutions that can um, get funding for maintenance staff for, um, in some cases, capital improvement means that that is public dollars that the city of New York is not having to invest in those specific parks. I mean, if you think about what it would cost the city of New York to maintain Central Park and Prospect Park alone, um, without any sort of private support, there would be so little left, if not anything left, for the other parks that are really essential to neighborhoods. And I think you know, to Masoom's point, like for communities that do not have some of these um, private organizations in place, that those public dollars are absolutely essential and there aren't enough of them as it stands now. So for us, you know, having nonprofit partners that can 
help offset what the city needs to put into specific parks um, is actually I, I, for us a beneficial uh, aspect of how the park system functions. I mean, the, these organizations came about in response to the fiscal crisis of the 1970s. And you know, we, we still aren't back to the level of funding publicly that the city of New York invested in the park system in the 70s. So, you know, for us, it's kind of a, a we need these organizations, they, but they've proven to be really essential. And, you know, it's, it's not without noting that these organizations have also taken in a lot of instances a fairly tremendous hit to their own budgets and donations in light of the pandemic and the, the recession that we're facing. So, um, you know, it, it seems on the face of it, like it, it's an issue of privatization, but for us, it really is a, a, a net good for the park system. And um, essentially it's freeing up funding that needs to go to parks and other parts of the city that we know need it vitally. Um, I'll turn it over to any of my co-panelists who might want to add to that. Yeah, I, I'll add on that, um, uh, Emily, thank you for that. I, I agree, I mean, a dollar that doesn't have to be spent by the city in, in Central Park, you know, shouldn't and often is spent in the, you know, the Bronx or, or Brooklyn or Queens. So, you know, we don't want, you know, keeping more money for the system, growing the pot is, is you know, what we're all about. And I think is, is very important. I will say just another point on, uh, in terms of, you know, in addition to leveraging the public city dollars um, with, with private dollars is often um, public private partners um, can help bring in, um, you know, federal and uh, state dollars as well. And that's critical. Um, we bring in money for capital, um, you know, largely spent in environmental justice neighborhoods. So we think that is a good public private partnership. And I will say that um, often um, uh, we're able to uh, uh, build faster and uh, less expensively um, and hopefully model some process changes that would help uh, the overall park system uh, build also build faster and cheaper over time. I just want this doesn't directly answer the question, but I, I want to mention a strategy that we are proposing, which is like of a green development fund. So whenever their dollars coming in, you know, either from city, state, federal, or even because we are in a very rapidly gentrifying community, even when they're profiteers of gentrification who are coming in, that that goes into like a pool of funds. And we want to call it the Green Development Fund, which is community control, where we can actually figure out, okay, uh, this should go into this park and this should go into this. The, and, and because like, we have issues like the dog parks in our community that are getting higher funding, double the funding sometimes than of some of our most important parks. So, you know, it's not only about the money coming in, it's also that it's not being split up um, fairly. So, you know, I feel like if there were community control pools like that, that that might be one solution towards um, this. Masoom, can, can I build on what Masoom says? She's absolutely right. And we've looked at park stewardship models um, you know, uh, there's some really good ones there that do um, really channel the community more. I would point to our own Bronx River Alliance, um, which really, you know, has been critical in bringing back uh, the Bronx River and the parks around it and wouldn't have happened without um, community support at many levels. Um, and that's a public-private partnership. You know, the, the um, City Parks Department has done a great job investing in that. Um, um, but there's also uh, community groups. And there's lots of examples that would point to what's happening down in DC at Anacostia um, in connection with something called the 11th Street Bridge Project. They're saving, they're replacing a bridge and they're saving the old bridge to build a park. And uh, it's really a model uh, for investing in, in the community before building uh, a, a structure that would have run the risk of gentrification. They're investing in some housing and other things first. Um, and that's a public private partnership um, reflecting community desires. So it's not one size fits all and they do provide a lot of flexibility to the city. I just, yes, yes, yes and yes. And I wanted to just piggyback and say um, to something that Masoom mentioned in her presentation, I, I think there is um, a lot of misconceptions about the appropriate role for volunteers in managing parks. And there are definitely the, the question of volunteerism definitely relates to the question of equity and kind of the role of conservancies because there's a big difference, um, a big difference between tasking a community with raising dollars and with asking a community to 
offer its sweat equity to supplement the funds of park maintenance. And I'll just share one stat, which is that from our forest management framework, based on 10 years of work under the Million Trees campaign, we estimated that it actually costs volunteers 27 thousand dollars per acre to do the same work that it costs paid staff six thousand dollars per acre to do the cost of recruiting training supervising ensuring volunteers is incredibly expensive and i think just want to put out there as we think about equity that um volunteerism is a burdensome and costly um approach to doing certain types of work and it doesn't doesn't work as a substitute for um, public sector investment, which is critically important, especially in places where there isn't the um, opportunity to raise large private pots of money. And it does feel to me like there's an opportunity to to do sort of what Masoom talked about from other places, right? Like I, I live in an extraordinarily Park Ridge neighborhood we don't need as much public investment that should be redirected elsewhere. And how can we make sure, or even private investment, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, here in, um, in between the really under underserved um, Central Park, uh, Riverside Park and Hudson River Park, for which I'm extraordinarily grateful. <laughs> um, there is a specific question for you, Carter. What has been the uh, biggest obstacle to breaking ground on the green infrastructure project known as Queensway? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for, for asking that question. Um, happy to speak about it. Um, I did not do that. I did not set this up for Carter. So thank you to the audience member who did. Yeah, thank you to the, I saw who, who asked for it. So I thank you to the uh, 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 person who asked that. Um, yeah, so if, we, if people don't know, they can go to a website called thequeensway.org. Um, it, you know, it's, re, it's a right of way that's been sitting in central Queens for 60 years, abandoned. <laughs> and it, it's three and a half miles. It'd be a great greenway. That's our proposal. And we have a plan, shovel ready, uh, 47 acre park, seven of which are in uh, already in Forest Park and mapped as, as, uh, as parkland. So, um, you know, it's really a tremendous resource for folks at Queens and dips down to community boards nine and 10 to get into the details, which are the most diverse in the city. So it would, uh, you know, really address a lot of issues, including the 12 schools that are around the Queensway and don't have access to open space. Why hasn't it happened? Well, you know, two reasons really. Um, you know, one is, um, uh, you know, transportation is a big issue in Queens. And, you know, there's many folks for years who did want to explore a North-South uh, railroad there. We didn't think it was feasible and actually the MTA studied this. Most recently um, in 2019, put out a report that said it would just cost billions of dollars um, and cause some backup problems on the Long Island Railroad. So wouldn't address that. Our point is very simply, it is a transportation corridor. <laughs> this is green transportation. It crosses seven subway lines and the Long Island Railroad, um, you know, allows people to safely walk or bike to a train station. Uh, so view it as that and also as a park. But lastly, and for the candidates here, it's really a commitment of the public folks. You know, I think, you know, this is a model, it's not a place that's going to be upzoned like Williamsburg or even, you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park or a place like that. It's gonna take a, a commitment in um, public dollars. They can be federal and state as well as city, um, you know, but a commitment to build it, not in connection with a big upzoning, but just build it for the people of New York and the people of Queens. And if you look at what's been committed to, you know, for great parks in Manhattan, um, you know, uh, uh, several billion dollars uh, in the last decade or the Brooklyn Queens waterfront, Central Queens really kind of deserves this. And we think a strong commitment by the candidates would put it over the edge. So speaking of spending money, um, we got a question about how parks can spend so much money on things that seem like they shouldn't cost as much money. And the examples being, you know, $1.5 million to renovate an existing bathroom um, or $6.2 million to replace three water fountains. Um, do you have any idea um, or who wants to tackle this one on, on how they get these, these, um, these figures and how they, these projects that seem relatively small um, can cost so much money? I don't want to tackle the 
uh, question, but I want to add to it and say that we were we were researching um, how to turn like one of the parks that are heavily polluted right in front of El Puente called La Guardia Park into an urban forest. So we were just preparing a budget to submit to the state senator's office and you know, we were like, oh, how much does grass, <laughs> gra like just having grass so that, you know, we don't have that much concrete cover across, like having more permeable surfaces. And it was just such, so bizarre, the costs per square foot. And, you know, just planting a tree, plant, like just simple things was so horribly expensive that it became so clear why we only had dying and dead trees and why we didn't have any infrastructure that could actually be considered um, healthy in that particular part of the neighborhood. So I I just echo that question and I want to know why as well. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll, I'll attempt, um, I don't think I have an answer for why the costs are so extreme, but obviously the capital process for parks is um, one that is in bad need of reform. And I, I would argue it's more than even just parks. I think the capital process citywide is a broken one. I think parks is just one of the most like public examples and it's really easy for for New Yorkers because we all love and use our parks. It's very visceral when you see the like absurd price tags. I mean, I think, you know, part of it is, is the fact that the agency isn't able to do a lot of the capital projects themselves. So they have to put it out to bid to contractors that, you know, like inherently drives up the cost because the agency isn't able to do some of this work themselves. Um, and, you know, the, the, the timeline of the process also draws things out and makes costs higher. Um, and that's something that New Yorkers for Parks has, has worked with some of our organizational peers. I think Toba, who asked this question, is a longtime advocate that I've worked with over the years. So thank you, Toba, for bringing attention to this. Um, and and it, the fact that, like, I think some 70 percent of the, the capital process is out of the control of the Parks Department itself means that it's just, you know, there, there are so many cogs in the wheel that contribute to a broken system that doesn't go a long way to explaining the cost, per se, but it is. Um, you know, the fact that there aren't sort of standard designs is, is a problem. So that's something that um, the city and the state have tried to shift more towards. There is some state legislation and Carter, I think might know a, a bit more about this than I would, but the design build legislation that was passed is an attempt to try and sort of rein in some of these projects that should be standardized. They should not cost so much money, um, but we need to have that implemented. And I think there needs to be some more political will, frankly, to to really reform the capital process as it stands because it, it hasn't been working and it is making projects just absurdly expensive and it's contributing to inequities in terms of the fact that like investments aren't being made where they need to be made because it's so expensive. I don't know, Carter, if you wanna um, add to that. Very quickly, um, you know, I will say that the Center for Urban Futures put out some good reports and studies, um, you know, so you can look at that, it's well documented. Um, it's also clear, as Emily said, it's a citywide problem. Um, and I will just note that uh, DDC recently, Department of Design and Construction, just recently testified that because of some uh, emergency powers they had in COVID to build COVID-related facilities and some other things, um, they were able to build much quicker. So the city is really getting in its own way with red tape, should be a priority of the next mayor, um, and design build legislation, which has been granted by the state, um, but not fully implemented by um, you know, all agencies, is one solution. Great, I think that is all we have time for tonight. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Sarah, Masoom, Emily, and Carter. That was terrific. We can talk about parks all day. We know that, we often do. Um, and we have more to do to making our, our park system uh, more equitable and make sure that we're investing in it so that it continues to be there for our future. As a little side note, I one of the books I am resting atop is The Power Broker. Um, so learning about um, how shoddy it was when they actually first did some work at Bryan Park. Um, thank you, Tammany Hall. Um, but I do wanna thank all of our, our panelists as well as uh, all of our attendees tonight. If you would like to view the discussion again, or you got here late or had to leave early, we will be posting the recording on our YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash NYLCV. Um, we hope to see you at our next and last panel, which is 5.30 on the 22nd, uh, which is next Monday, where we're going to be covering resiliency. We have put an RSVP link in the chat. Please follow us on at NYLCV on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for updates. And if you're not already on our email list, please sign up at www.nylcvef.org. And that is our program for the evening. Thank you all. And 
be safe out there. It doesn't look like we got too much snow tonight, but I know there's more coming. So thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you.